Hi, um, my name's Sean Grant. Uh, welcome to this uh, workshop. I'm going to be talking about and looking at how we engage with young people on the edge of education um, that may uh, be at risk of exclusion, uh, may have already been excluded. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna do this in a couple of ways. I'm gonna sort of explore the local um, context for you and sort of uh, break that down. Um, what that looks like in certain regions in the Diocese of Sheffield, um, and also what the context is for a young person when education breaks down. For them. We're then gonna look at a bit of a biblical mandate. Um, what what verse uh, in particular? Uh, really uh, grounds that for me um, and just sort of I, I guess explore a little bit of God's heart for that. Then we're going to look at a couple of op options and opportunities, um, ones that I've used in the past um, and ones that we've explored and some, th some things I see now that I work in education. And finally we're going to end with a great interview with a friend of mine um, who I used to work with, she's my former boss, called Emma um, and she uh, set up um, with a tiny bit of help from me but very minimal um, a great uh, project called Salted which is an alternative provision project but before we get on um, I think it'd be good just to introduce myself um, so I'm Sean I'm 30 um, only just and it's taken a, a lot to get over uh, but yeah I'm 30 now and I've been doing youth work for 15 years I became a youth well I sort of started leading a rock solid club when I was 15 um, in my local church and then I guess I've already always been in and around youth work um, I took a degree at Sheffield Hallam um, and have done like sort of pastoral work in prisons um, and worked in a range of different youth settings there's only a couple I'm really going to delve into um, just as we sort of start and one is I spent a year working in care um, residential care for young people and I loved it um, but what it really gave me and sort of instilled in me was a real start to an understanding of what it is to work with children uh, in crisis um, and what it is to work with those who are disengaged and who have realistically education hasn't worked out for them and I, I loved it. Um, it was probably one of my favourite jobs, um, but it was also really hard just seeing the distrust in the system and how um, they felt like they didn't have anyone, even though we were trying to do our best as staff, that actually um, we, we were very different and actually that was really difficult. And the second one is I was a youth worker for uh, three and a half years at my um, church, which is what's the church, which is brilliant, and um, and it was quite funny because I had the opportunity to move to Wadsley, and a lot of my friends who know me, who, who know my passion is for those on the edge, were like, Sean, why are you going there? Um, why why there? Like, you're not going to find those kids on the edge, and uh, I just felt it was right. Um, a lot of my friends are moving there, but like, I just felt like God was saying that this person. Um, even though it felt really weird. Um, and then when I started as a youth worker, it was sort of like, well, where are the young people? Well, we started a lot of stuff. We started attached work, which was very hard, um, very long and laborious, um, as some of you may know. But actually, we saw real fruit and we started to see those on the fringes, those on the edge, um, come towards um, what we were doing. And out of that came um, some schools work. And I'm going to talk about uh, the schools work in a little bit. But out of that, we uh, started some schools work and a youth club, which grew to um, about 160 young people who were all on the edge, who are on our books, um, which brought a lot of social issues, um, brought a lot of tension. And it was a very difficult thing to manage. And I didn't get it right all the time. Um, not even half the time, but actually um, it was really good to see God saying, like I said, I would bring these people um, and, and having it was really amazing. So that's sort of where I'm from. Um, I'm just going to 
I think it'd be good to start with a, a prayer um, before we sort of delve into things. So um, as you're watching this, pray however you want to pray. If you want to put your hands together, if you want to close your eyes, if you stand praying on your, uh, standing on your head, uh, then do that. Um, yeah, I'll just pray. Lord, we just, uh, we invite you into this time. I pray that you open our hearts, open our minds, open our eyes to what you are saying to us. Would you point out opportunities to us? Would you point out people to us? Would you just reveal your heart for those on the edge for us? And would you instill in us a belief and a faith that you say great things are to come? Yeah. Amen. So I think it would be good to um, to start with uh, the young person um, and sort of looking at what a young person's story is. Now, if you think about um, a, a young person, a young boy called Ben, for example, um, and Ben is he's he's brought up in a way where there is a life, an ideal life set for him. It's in cartoons, it's in the media, it's uh, what his friends talk to him about. Of You go to primary school and you're really excited about um, your first day of primary school. Um, Ben's really excited um, and then and he does really well um, and he gets into a little bit of trouble. But he's all right and then and then something happens and he falls out with his teacher. So he feels like he's on the back foot. And what he starts to question is, well, what have I done? Is it me? And a lot of the time what, what Ben then will do is push away the teacher. will test the boundaries. And, and then it might go towards, oh, well, actually what I see before the, the plan set out in Biker Grove or Grain Trail, um, Biker Grove was farther than I know I've got bias, um, or Waterloo Road is, oh yeah, you know what, you go to school, then you go to secondary school, and when, and when you've done well in your exams, then you can go to university. And that's where success is, that's where value is. Um, but what happens when we don't reach that point? What happens when a young person doesn't reach that point because school is becoming hard, they, they are disengaged. Their story and their hope and the right story that has been set out before them from day one is gone. That actually, they now don't know what's in front of them. There's just questions. So it comes into that is, hopelessness and abandonment, um, anxiety, anger, frustration. There is so much going on for that young person that their future that is set out before them is gone. So what do they have? The question is, what do they have? And a lot of them will answer that by um, by getting involved in gangs, by um, by running drugs or whatever, and it's, oh, well, this is what I've got. And the question young people are always asking is, well, what hope do I have? And our, our opportunity is to provide that hope. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And one of the things I see in school, so I work in school now um, as a head of year, working with behavior and pastoral issues. A lot, one of the things I really see is when a young person he has missed out on a bit of education or doesn't feel confident in the subject, a lot of the time they will put on a front and will fight back because actually it's easier to be noticed for behaviour than for a lack of knowledge. And for me, what I've learned over these years is behaviour always has a reason. There is always a reason for behaviour. I know in my life, this stuff has happened to me, affects me now. Stuff that happened 10 years ago affects me now. And it's the same for our young people, but they, a lot of the time, don't have the emotional intelligence to realise that. And it is our opportunity to step into that and help them to process that, which is a, the big thing that I'm going to focus on. 
I just want to set the um, the context, like the sort of local context. So of um, of all the local authorities in the country, uh, these stats are from 2018 to 2019, uh, which are the latest stats available. You can find them on the government website. Uh, if you want to find them out, just drop me an email or drop me a message in the comments and I will uh, post them. So in 2018 and 2019, Doncaster was the third highest local authority for fixed term exclusion rate. So the national average for um, fixed term exclusion rate is 5.36. And Doncaster was at 19.14, behind only Hartlepool and Redcar and Cleveland. And what that says to me is there are young there are swathes of young people who are missing out on their education and there are huge barriers to their education and then if we look at sort of other areas barnsley is 14.17 which is really high above the national average again and then if we if we look at cities cities there and um, because there isn't the same range in uh, deprivation uh, uh, yeah, there's a wider range in deprivation in cities. You get a lower average. And in the cities, um, we find that Sheffield, comparatively, has um, one of the highest rates. The highest rate in the city is in Nottingham, which is 8.07. And the next city is actually Sheffield, which is 7.83. If you're looking at similar cities, you've got Derby is 6.71. Leeds is 5.22, Manchester 7.09. These might seem just like numbers, but actually the rates in this region are higher than the national average by quite a significant amount. Rotherham is 7.69. So what we are seeing here is there is, a, there is an issue in terms of there are there is a whole generation of young people in South Yorkshire and the Diocese of Sheffield who are missing out on their education, who are missing gaps. And that is when we start to see um, other things come into play. This, the stats show that um, if you're in prison, then there's a high likelihood that you have been excluded from school. That the uh, involvement in crime, um, involvement in crime re usually correlates pretty well with being excluded from school. And then if we look at permanent exclusions, so fixed term exclusions might just be a day, but permanent exclusions are whether the school has no other option, whether they have tried every other avenue. Um, permanent exclusions are very hard for a school to pass. And the national average is 0.1. And Doncaster is around the eighth worst local authority in the country. It has a rate of 0.22, um, which is, is very high, obviously. And Barnsley is 0.2. So again, we, we see actually there, there are, there's a rate of young people that is significantly higher than the national average who aren't able to access education in, in this class of format. Some might go to inclusion centres, but some might be completely disengaged. And if we look at cities, cities again, it's the same sort of thing where um, the, the rates are lower because of the greater range in, um, in deprivation. And the top city in the country is, is Derby with the 0 0.18. But after that, you have three cities which are 0 0.15, Nottingham, Sheffield and Newcastle. So what we are seeing is that this area, the, uh, the areas of this diocese, there are young people who are losing out on education. And for me, what that means is there are young people that don't know what their future is, that feel hopeless, that feel like they don't know where to go. And there is a real call for me to, um, to step into that, to step into that void. 
Now, what we're going to talk about later are assaulted, which is an alternate provision project. Um, and that is more for those who maybe mainstream education isn't working for. And so we're, I'm going to talk about that for, uh, later. But first, I want to sort of um, look at sort of the biblical mandate of what verse is really important to me um, and sort of where my passion comes from and sort of what I believe God says about these kids. Um, and then we're going to look at um, some intervention stuff that I have uh, wrote with a colleague um, and sort of what, what opportunities we can explore. So I just want, to, uh, want you to turn, if you can, to Isaiah 58. And um, this is a really key verse in my life. So my mom, uh, she used to run a charity in the Northeast, which was housing homeless young women um, and homeless young mums. It was called Aquila Way. Um, she was absolutely brilliant and uh, is a real inspiration to me. And she started a project that was based on this verse, actually. Um, and I just want to read it because for me, this is really what we are in the business of. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called a power of broken walls, a store of streets, of dwellings. When I look at the media and um, the illustration of young people of this uh, generation is incredibly negative. We have rising uh, knife crime, we have rising uh, gun involvement, county lines is um, massive, uh, Sheffield um, sits right on the uh, on the county line so we we deal with that sort of thing and, and actually what we are seeing is uh, a generation and a demographic who have had their future. They've, they've la lost sight of hope. They've lost sight of what their future can look like. The enemy has stolen it away. And they feel ruined. I have spoken to a lot of young people that have sort of, they don't know anything else. Because they don't, they're worth. They don't. They don't feel like they're worth anything. And actually, when we speak the worth of Jesus, it doesn't have to be so explicit. But when we speak the worth of Jesus, we speak the hope and there's hope over them. We can see that young person start to come back to who Jesus, God made them to be, because they are so loved. A lot of the time, what is seen is the behavior and the behavior starts to get attached to the, who the person is but and, it, and so a young person can might be uh, getting kicked out of class and stuff like that and i've heard comments in staff rooms in different schools where it's like oh that kid's a nightmare that kid's uh, not a nice kid and they might not say nice things but actually, I believe there's a story behind that. That there is a person that God's heart breaks for. And there is a call uh, on us. Um, there's, I mean, there's that classic song, um, Hosanna from Hillsong, where it says, break my heart for what breaks yours. And I think there is, um, there is a... It, there is a real call for us to sort of cry that out for, for the kids who are on the edge. For those on the edge, there is this impression sometimes that they are bad people. But I know and I sing that Jesus is the redeemer. That Jesus is the redeemer for these people. That we can see them rebuilt. We can see them restored. And that is my prayer. That is what I go into work with. That is what I go into um, 
that is what I go into sort of uh, schools with, is that these people can be redeemed, they can be restored. So um, I'm just going to talk about uh, something we did. We were, um, I was a youth worker at a church, and we were thinking, how do we serve our schools? And you're going to hear a little bit about how we started serving uh, one school, just sort of offering some coaching. Um, but I want to talk to you about uh, the second, the second secondary school I worked in, and we sort of read their Ofsted report and sort of like, right, okay, well maybe we could help them with behaviour. Um, and I sat down with the uh, deputy head and said, listen, like we can, um, we'll, we're, ha we're happy to offer every, anything you uh, would like, but we can offer some coaching and work and behaviour. Um, and she set us this challenge of, right, okay, I want, to, want you to improve behaviour in six weeks and increase student voice. If 36 of our worst students in seven, year seven and eight. Like, oh, wow, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, and it was a challenge. I went in with a colleague uh, called Liv um, and it was incredible. Um, God was really at work. We, we did quite a few simple things that I find are, um, are quite useful in working in a school because I think sometimes the there is a distrust between young people and school because teachers have to manage a situation that I work in a school, it's really difficult. And I sense a distrust with some young people with me being part of the system. And actually as youth workers, we've got an opportunity to not be part of that system. So one of the key things I always tried was making sure that I could wear trainers that I could wear a hoodie because I wasn't a teacher. Actually, I was something different and it was about establishing something on the young people's level. So even that, you're, you're distinguishing yourself and you're saying, well, no, actually I'm here for you. Um, and, uh, there's a few things, I'm just gonna give a few tips. Uh, one thing we really felt was important is that classic activity of, let's come up with some rules. Um, and then when the old people suggested, oh, no swearing, we questioned that and said, well, why? Um, oh, well, you just shouldn't. But my uh, theory on this and sort of going back to youth work and um, like sort of how we communicate, if a young person has been brought up with swearing as part of their life, when we tell them to not swear, when we are trying to get them to engage with their stories, we are limiting what they communicate. So for me, whenever I've done one-to-ones or group work that is, that is about the young person's story, I won't limit their communication like that. I'll say no gratuitous swearing, but actually opening that up allows the young people to, to relax and be like, well, I can, I can communicate because sometimes they like, otherwise they have to dampen down their emotions a lot of the time and we're not getting the real thing. And actually it's really important to allow them to explore that range. What we found is um, we tried to, we sort of made it up as we went along, but it was very much about centering on a young person's story. We talked about how our own behaviors were affected by what has happened to us. Um, and so pretty much every activity we did, we talked about masks we wear, um, but we really engaged with our story. So I talked quite openly about my mum passing and how I reacted to that. Um, because I remember a quote, and I can't remember where it's from, but I thought it was really good. It might be in Francis Chan, and he says, um, my vulnerability is a bridge to someone else's vulnerability. And actually us taking that first step allowed the young people to feel braver because someone had already come first. And the thing is, there was all these young people who were saying, uh, we, we feel like we're never listened to. I hear that in school now. I try and make sure, like, I'm always going to listen to you. I may not agree with you, but I'm always going to listen to you. And actually being that listener, being that constant, 
was something that we found really key. And because the thing is, we can sort of like offer behavioral tips and we did do a bit of anger management and sort of uh, ways that you can sort of react in that moment. We did some sort of practical tips on how to enter a room because that makes a difference to a teacher's impression of you and things like that. But what we really focused on was the young person's story. Because what I've found is young people that are on the edge of exclusion have had countless people working with their behaviours. It might be they've had a psychologist working with their behaviour. It might be that they've been diagnosed with something that is about their behaviour. It might be, um, which are all correct. But we've got an opportunity to be the person that engages with a story. And we did that in several different ways. We used rap music, we used um, art, we used a lot of different methods. And actually, you just pointing out to them, well, Tupac and Eminem were great storytellers that talked about their feelings. And actually that really opened up things. Using the old person's medium is far better than using their own. I want to tell you one story um, before uh, I just ask Emma to join us. Um, so we had two brothers that we worked with, um, both dyslexic, both very behind in their uh, learning, um, very angry. Um, their nun was dying, um, but school didn't know. Um, they very much kept it to themselves and were just very angry got kicked out of lessons all the time. One, because they were defensive about feeling stupid. And another, because, well, they didn't know how to deal with their nandine. And so we started it. We, they were part of our first group uh, of 36 boys that then became 54 young people. And we split it into six and eights. Um, and we started working with them, sort of saying, well, our stories are, are important. Like I talked about my story. And this slowly started to open up. And we were able to work with school and sort of say, well, this is happening, like, what support can we put in place? And they didn't have a clue about Nan and stuff like that. And actually, those boys became far more trusting of school because someone had listened to them. Their Nan actually died and me and my colleague lived. We, um, we support them through that. Um, we we prayed with them uh, not in school they were part of our youth club which was sort of linked and um, but because obviously they came to youth club we got more permission um and it was a really positive thing they were really um they were amazing boys and they're in my football team that i run uh, as part of scyl um which is like three years down the line that i still have that and actually now i don't have to build speaking into their lives because our relationship was founded on me speaking into their life. And actually there's a real opportunity because actually the most important thing we did was we had youth club connected. And so the relationship was never just about school. It was about outside of school as well. And that was really key that we had that balance. So I'm just gonna, um, well, you're saying you get changed, you'll see it become daytime. You'll see me move to my sofa, but I'm just going to uh, in, well, invite Emma to join us. Um, and she's got some really good stuff for us. Um, and yeah, it'll, it's, I mean, it's really good. And I was really lucky to be part of it. So, yeah. Uh, hi, Emma. Thank you for joining us. Um, hi. So, like I said, Emma is a former colleague of mine. Um, and is an absolutely incredible person. Um, yeah, you are, Emma. Um, <laughs> but first, can I just uh, sort of ask you, well, how are you, how are you doing this morning? With yeah, I'm all right, thank morning. you. <laughs> You're all right then, yeah? yeah. And um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself uh, before, just to give everyone an idea of who you are and what you're doing so far? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I worked as a secondary English teacher for 10 years 
um, and I'm also part of the church leadership team. Um, I guess what I'm about uh, is kind of discipleship, helping people to um, kind of take the next step in their walk, kind of wherever that is, whether that's pressing in more to faith or whether that is just experiencing God's love for the first time. I just kind of love seeing where people are at and trying to um, move them on in that. Yeah, cool. Um, so, obviously, uh, well, I, I know uh, what um, Salted is and everything like that. Um, that's where I used to work with Emma. Um, can you tell me what is Salted um, and like, what does Salted mean? And, and yeah, just sort of give us a brief overview of what that is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Salted is an alternative education provision. So um, it's, it's on our church site, run out of our church hall, um, and we use the scout building as well. Um, and it's a place where young people can come when they're kind of on the edge of mainstream education for whatever reason. So for some of them, it's that they're at risk of permanent exclusion. So it's um, due to behaviour or family issues or whatever's going on, impacting their attendance, impacting um, yeah, just how, how well they're doing at school. And um, for some of them, it's about anxiety or um, special educational needs that maybe aren't being um, met or haven't been flagged up yet, um, meaning that they struggle to access school. Some of them, it's, it's a fear and um, it's not liking being in, um, in busy classrooms or walking around the building or whatever it is. But so we kind of we kind of have these kids for, that are with us for all different reasons. Um, but all because there's something, some barrier that's stopping them from accessing um, a normal mainstream education. So they come to us uh, for um, between one and four days a week um, as part of their package of education. So some of them still attend school for some days. Some of them go to other provisions as well. Um, and we focus on supporting them towards achieving GCSEs in English and Math. So what we find is a lot of provisions um, work on a vocational skill, maybe with a little bit of English or math support. But what we do is, um, is based on the idea that just because you're struggling with school for some reason doesn't mean you're not capable of achieving those GCSEs. So we aim to support with those and sometimes with others as well, with other subjects. But we also around that have a kind of package that heavily focuses on PSHE, on the kind of youth work side of things developing self-esteem and um, activities around what each young person is interested in and trying to tackle some of the issues that they're facing. Um, so we work a lot with other professionals as well and with the schools. All the children that we have are still on roll with the school so they have a big input in their education too. Um, so it's just kind of trying to find a way to, to get these kids a positive experience of education and get them onto whatever's next. That's great. I mean, obviously, I, I worked there for a, a couple of years, and um, I can say it's 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 incredible, and um, and yeah, it's just it's so cool to see. So, um, obviously, we've got this project that uh, has been built that is uh, working with the council, working with schools. But but how did we? How did you get there? And and where did it come from? Like, what was? Where did the idea come from? Uh, where like, how did we get to this point? It's a funny one, actually, that question. I feel like there's lots of things that came together and it was sort of, we were in the right place at the right time, I think. Um, from my point of view, well, from the church leadership point of view, I think we had this sense that we should be doing something for our local community. We should be going into schools. We should be working out what we can do to help and support um, different agencies and families. And then... And we tried a few things with going into schools, but they didn't necessarily all work. Um, but then, well, I guess this is your bit, really, because you went into a local school, didn't you? And, and do you want to tell your bit of how we kind of came up with the idea? Yeah, a uh, bit of a self-plug. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I did, a, like, I guess, a foundation in coaching. And was as I was a youth worker at the church at the time. And was sort of like, well, what what can I do? Like, what can I offer the young people? Um, and and how do we sort of influence and 
support the schools in our local area. So I got in touch with uh, a contact we had at our lo at a local comp, just saying, this is what I can offer. Um, so I had a meeting with him, and then he brought me into a meeting that was all the heads of year and the leadership team. And they were like, well, can you do this? And can you do this? And can you do this? So I was like, yeah, sure. Thinking I would have to prove myself, but actually they just sort of went, well, yeah, do this. But then they also said, I think there's a deputy head said, maybe in a couple of years you could be our AP. And I was like, wow, that, that's like some of the, like, I've sort of like dreamt about and, um, and it was really cool. But then also it was like, how are we ever going to do that? Um, so then I started doing coaching in school, in the school sort of just working with uh, some of the young people that were right on the edge. If they were struggling with sort of mental health, a lot of it was behaviour. Uh, and I was doing some one-to-one -one work and it built quite a, probably quite a good reputation in there. And then it just sort of came from there, I think, just sort of having that connection. And this deputy head saying that one thing. I think sparked this conversation amongst uh, quite a few of us of yeah. where we could we do this um, and and yeah it just sort of went from there as far as I can remember. Yeah, I think as well from my point of view, I was I was working in a mainstream school teaching English, and I think I was getting more and more frustrated that there were these students in my classes that were struggling for whatever reason. Um, you know, with mental health, with other family issues, um, were maybe not attending much or attending and not really doing anything. And I wanted to sit with them and work with them and support them. And all my kind of youth worker instincts <laughs> were coming out, but there wasn't time, there wasn't space within the curriculum to do that. So I think it just was a growing frustration that I wanted to be able to work with the few rather than churn out the lessons for the 30 kids in front of me. Yeah, you're um, quite like me in that way, aren't you? It's drawn, drawn to the ones on the edge a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah um, so where did it go from there? We found that people, other people just started to spring up that had a similar vision to us. Um, a guy called Dave who um, was working in the pastoral side of things in schools and was was the person that was referring kids to, to AP. And he just felt like there needed to be something different in the city and that churches should be doing this kind of thing. So he got on board and um, he was amazing because of his knowledge of how, to, uh, of how these things worked. His knowledge of doing it from a school side really helped us to get it going. Um, and yeah, we just built this incredible team of people that really wanted to help and impact young people's lives. Yeah, that, I mean, that's really cool. I mean, I can remember when, obviously, we were sort of first coming up with the idea and then putting the, putting the flesh to the bones almost. And it was like, it was, it was incredible how much fell into place. Mm. Uh, and there was a lot of late nights of trying to get certain bids in or whatever. But actually, like, it, it all did come together. Like, just, you could tell that God was really in it because... It, it just seemed everything that should have happened happened yeah. um, and it was incredible. So, so sort of as, as you started this, um, I think it's really important sometimes to, you know, go back to the foundation and sort of what are the principles it's been built on and what makes it, uh, what makes it different to, you know, uh, a classic AP that you've talked about. And I guess part of that as well, just because I know and I think it's a good thing to talk about is, why the name Salted and, uh, and everything like that? Yeah, okay. So I think we, we felt at the time that there was a real call on our church to bring restoration to, um, to the area, I guess, but to lives, to people, and to just meet those needs. And I think with these kids that we're working with, and, well, the families in general sometimes, there's, it just feels like, something has broken down and it's about finding what that is and rebuilding it um, and I think in terms of bible verses um to me it's always been Micah 6 8 and what does the Lord require of you to act justly love mercy and to walk humbly with your God so what does it mean to bring justice 
um, in education where maybe things aren't always that fair, where maybe there's this one size fits all approach that doesn't work for every child. Um, and also, again, similarly, Proverbs 31, verse 8 to 9, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. And I think so much about what we do is more than um, more than what we say we do, in a way. It's about getting alongside these families, understanding what their issues are, being the voice in the meetings where decisions are made, um, Sometimes where parents don't really know how to fight for their children because they're not experienced in the system, we have that insight of what you need to say and who you need to go to and uh, to be able to support them. And in terms of the name, um, Matthew 5.13, Salt and Light, it's about, it's about that saltiness. It's about finding the, the pure um, essence of who each young person is and kind of weeding out the rubbish that's got in there, bringing that hope and that light into their situation. And also, it's quite a handy uh, shortening of Sheffield Alternative Education. <laughs> it is. So, uh, it's a great combination that also appeals to, uh, to schools and councils. So that's yeah. great. <laughs> um, so, so it's been quite a long process um, and I love what it's built on, just on that sort of uh, seeking justice of uh, the of restoring young people and so through all this um, what would you say uh, you have learned oh gosh um, so many things <laughs> um, I think I've learned that um, that if God's in it and God's going to do it then it will succeed. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean there won't be drawbacks. It doesn't mean it's not scary. Um, you know, and I've had to learn to do things along the way that weren't in my skill set at all. Um, like all the um, writing tenders for the council to get the contracts um, and loads of things to do with budgeting and leading a team and all sorts of things. But it's just felt like God's hand is on it. He's doing this thing. Um, and we get to join in with it, I guess. So, yeah, I think it's scary, but God always comes through. That's what I've learned. Um, and I think just that it's such it can be such slow going in sometimes and feel like a slog. But there's always small breakthroughs. Um, so learning to take stock and to see the successes, I think, has been really important. And um, also, I think a, a surprise for me has been that there's more resistance from inside the church from outside than outside and um, I think it can feel like oh nobody's going to want a church to do this everybody's going to be suspicious of us you know the schools won't want to refer kids to something that's church run because they'll think it's bible bashing or something but it hasn't been like that at all they've been really open about it really positive positive. Um, but it's been within church that people have said can we really do this is it safe? What, you know, what about all these things? And, and it's absolutely right to think everything through and to look for what the issues might be. But I think we need to be braver <laughs> as churches and be more willing to step out into things that are scary and new. Um, because I think our experience is it does work. And if God's hand is on it, it will, it will happen and he will come through. Yeah, what has been the hardest thing throughout this journey? What has been the sort of the the hard like days or the hardest sort of like um, the over everything going on? Uh, yeah, what is what have been the really tough times? I think the hardest thing has been the painful decisions we've had to make when um, when students' behaviour has been really difficult. Um, when perhaps we've realised that we can't meet the needs of every child. Um, I always think it's really important, almost once, once we've got the kids, that we fight for them and we do everything for them. Um, but there's a point where we have to say, we can't do this and, you know, more specialist services need to be involved or different provisions. And um, so, yeah, I think the decisions where it's been like, we cannot meet the needs of this child and we're going to have to say that they can't come anymore. 
for the safety of others um, or for their own protection. That's been really hard, but, but it's been important. We can't save everyone and God can, <laughs> but we can't. And it's not about us um, kind of having to take charge or having to take someone on as our project, but it's about saying it's in God's hands and kind of prayerfully making the right decisions for everyone. But on the sort of like more positive side, so I think um, there are going to be hard times, but also I know that there have been a lot of victories, uh, a lot of uh, times to celebrate. Um, what Can you tell me about some of those? Yeah, I think for me, it's seeing the, the transformations in the young people, however, however small or however much you kind of have to look to see them. But I think there's two students that stand out particularly for me over the past two and a half years where it feels like something's really changed. And that's not all down to what we're doing, but it's partly um, down to the input that they've had with us. So we had um, in our first year, we had one girl who was just struggling with so many issues in her personal life. She was in care and her younger siblings were being put up for adoption. It just felt like she was constantly let down. Um, and um, yeah, she didn't feel like she had anybody that was her voice that was speaking up for her. And, um, but she came to really trust us. She came to particularly trust one of our volunteers um, who spent a lot of time with her and it really sort of built her confidence and you could see her positivity growing. And she came in nearly every day um, that she was supposed to. And even on her 16th birthday, where we didn't know whether she'd disappear off, but she came in because I think she knew she'd be loved and fed and she could talk to us. Um, and that was just special. And it didn't resolve all the problems in her life. And um, she was still struggling with a lot of things, but but she opened up and she talked and she cried and we were able just to listen really and help her. And she did get some GCSE results. They weren't brilliant. They weren't probably what she was fully capable of, but, but they were what she could manage at that time really. Um, yeah. And then another one, um, there's a boy um, that we've had in the last year or so, and he moved here from a different area to live with dad because um Social care said it wasn't safe for him to live with mum anymore. And that was really difficult for him. And when he first came to us, he barely spoke. He wouldn't engage in much. He wouldn't um, eat all day when he was with us. Um, he, yeah, it was just, it was a slog. We couldn't get much of a response out of him. But now um, he he's really engaging with maths and he's on track to achieve a decent grade in that, a, a grade five or six, which is um, a sort of solid C or B in old money um, and he'll do a bit of English work which um, doesn't seem like a lot but compared to um, the, the boy that used to say I don't English he now does a bit of English which is amazing he plays chess with other students he eats lunch he um, he'll go out for a walk with a staff member to have a chat and um, you know he'll have a laugh he'll play a ball game it just in a way, it's a lot of small things, but the change that we've seen in him has been amazing. Um, and that's, you know, it's not just our work, it's the work his dad's been doing as well and the work the school have put in, but it's that working together and having an impact and praying. I think the fact that, you know, they don't know that we pray for them, or well, maybe sometimes they do, but, um, but you know, most of the time we're just quietly praying for these young people and just believing that God's going to have an impact. Uh, I, I just want to say from from the kid that I knew, uh, I haven't been at Salt for a year. It sounds like such a transformation um, and for that for that one boy, and I think that's really cool. I just wanted to talk about uh, a couple of people. Sort of um, one was I worked with him in the secondary school we were talking about, and uh, and he I really I really got on with him. He was in a lot of trouble in school, uh, acted the big man. Um, but really wasn't, and was quite a soft person. And and then I I didn't see him. I, I stopped going into that secondary school. I uh, didn't see him. And then obviously I've left the role. And he he could have gone in to any AP. Um, and I talked about him on our celebration night. Obviously no names or anything like that. But on our on our launch night actually, as we were first launching the project. 
I told the story of this boy that for me had been really important in sort of a lot of uh, a lot of my, when I was taught, when I was thinking about how, where we went with Salted and like what my role was. I, I, this one boy had been quite core to that, um, and then things have obviously gone a bit awry at school over the past few years, which I could I could have probably seen coming, um, and he could have gone to any AP in the city. And he's ended up assaulted. Um, and for me, that's really precious. And just a sign of, uh, you know what, like, God's got him. Um, and that's really important to me. Like, uh, And he, it might still be difficult, but actually, like, that's really precious to me. Uh, and I know to, to a couple of other people. Uh, the other story I want to tell is um, a girl from the, from the same school who... Um, who came to our youth club uh, quite a lot and was quite uh, standoffish, um, but would always come and talk to me. Uh, like, even in the street, if she saw me, she'd just come and talk to me. And, like, she was very, she, there was a lot going on for her. And she pushed back a lot against Salted. Um, so much so she asked to leave. Um, and then things sort of went bad at her school. Um, and she has to come back. And the, the change in mindset and just like the, her willingness to engage and you could see the sense of importance she placed on it because she knew that we valued her. She knew that we valued her story. Um, she knew that to us she was important. Um, for me, that was just, she, I like just to see that and to know that um, even now, if she was struggling, she knew that she could come to us, um, that she would have a place where she knows she matters. I think is, uh, I think that is really core to what Salted has done really well over these past two and a half years, is making those kids feel important and making sure they know they matter. So, Emma, um, only, I've only got two more questions for you. Uh, the This one... Sort of building off those victories and sort of say, I'm sort of seeing these kids that were sort of like celebrating what they do. What has been what has been important in seeing that happen, and what has been important in uh, in where Salted is now? I think relationship is key. Everything is built on having a good relationship with these young people, and even even in the last couple of weeks. Um, talking to talking to one young person who never did anything terrible in school but was just always in trouble for arguing or refusing to do something um and I, I asked him why uh, why he was kind of so pleasant with us really <laughs> um and so willing to do what we were asking him to do and he said well in school you were the teacher for an hour so if they annoy you it it it's not that hard to tell them to F off or whatever he might have said. Um, but he said, with you, I'm with you all day and I kind of like you, so I wouldn't really want to say that to you. Um, and I think, you know, that is just, that just shows, doesn't it, that relationship is everything. If we can talk to young people like they matter to us and we respect them, we get the same back. And, and that is teaching them so much more about adult life and work life and things um, than these kind of barriers that they're coming across all the time. And I'm not at all saying that schools don't work hard to you know, build relationships. They do and teachers do, but it's, but it's the sheer number of people. This kind of small setting means we can just have much deeper relationships and start to address some of the issues. And in that, um, team is really important. Um, it's been so great that God's just brought us amazing people in Salted uh, right from the start. Um, amazing volunteers, amazing staff members. Um, that's just really helped us to have a positive team and build that positive environment. Um, and prayer. Prayer is key to everything we do. Um, we pray for each other, we pray for the young people. Um, you know, it's not it's not something that we're not talking all the time about God to the kids or anything like that, but the foundation of what we're doing is in God and in prayer. And I think that brings transformation. 
Great. Yeah. I think I can attest that uh, the days where it was a bit more rushed in the morning and we didn't have time to pray were definitely the most stressful days. Um, and I think it pointed out to us quite early, like the importance of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. The last question. So looking forward, what do you hope for the future? What's the dream, I guess, for, for Salt Lake, for the future of it? And for just like, I guess, like your hopes in general for these kids and stuff like that. Yeah, I think the hope for these kids is just that each individual that we've had an impact on them and that changes the course of something in their education or in their life and just equip them maybe better to deal with certain situations. Um, you know, even down to um, recently, a young person was talking to me about her struggles with sleep um, and I just mentioned a weighted blanket to her and uh, she got her dad to buy her one and she said it did help. You know, just the little things, if we can take that forward and she can sleep better, that'll have an impact on everything. So it's a lot of it, I think, is the little wins and um, just chipping away at things that'll have an impact on the young people's lives. Um, for Salted, I, I just think I think there's so much more we could do. Um, obviously, currently we're really restricted because of COVID um, in what we can do. So we can't really get into schools. Um, we can't really um, have any drop-ins or anything like that. But I would love to see us eventually going into schools, running groups with um, students that are struggling and just need a bit more input and um, some coaching and mentoring like you talked about earlier. Um, I'd love us to have homework clubs. I'd love us to have a range of things that kind of fill in the gap between youth club and um, attending an alternative provision. So drop-ins and mental health drop-ins and um, after school club and all those kind of things. Um, just to offer that full range of support from the kind of educational side to the pastoral side. Um, and just generally, as a church, I just want to see us stepping out more and more into what we can do to support our community. So um, so we're working with these young people, but what can we do for the parents and the families? Could we run parenting courses? Could we run budgeting classes? Could we um, do holiday hunger schemes? Um, you know, we're already doing food parcels. But I think it's just always be always thinking, what is God leading in? us into next that can impact our community and our city and not just settling for the things that we've always done or the things that seem obvious but just always asking the question of what what more can we do yeah great well emma that's been brilliant thank you very much um i know that i i love the work that salt would do um and the kids there are really special um and and yeah, I just want to thank you, uh, thank you for joining me on uh, this morning. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Bye. Bye.